Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Raj Pasord. I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in Harley Street, London, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Jane Van Riesenberg, who is a counsellor working for a very famous uh, clinic called uh, White River Manor. Jane, welcome to the programme. Um, you're uh, referred to as a counsellor on the website. Tell us a little bit about your job. What is it that you do? Okay. Hi, Dr. R. So Hi. I primarily counsel um, addiction. I'm an addiction therapist. So we've got our primary psychologist, and then I'm more the support for them with regards to coping skills that are going to be needed going forward. Um, I have walked the journey myself, so I do understand a bit about it. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm going to help with aftercare plans, step work, and obviously any other issues they might be facing about going home. So Jane, can you tell us a bit about your own journey? Um, you had a relationship then with substances of some kind. Is it okay to ask you a bit about that? Tell us a little bit about your story. Of course you story. can. <laughs> yeah. So what happened? So I um, became an alcoholic. Um, I probably started drinking quite heavily at the age of 27 after, after a divorce. Um, but Dr. Raj, it took me three rehabilitation centers to step out of denial and realize I have a problem. So I had a psychology degree already. I just hadn't used it. I was primarily in, in <laughs> and I don't laugh. How embarrassing. Um, <laughs> That's a great way of putting it, though. I had a psychology <laughs> degree. I had just not, never used it. I love that way of putting it. It just didn't make sense, you know. <laughs> as long as I didn't take prescription medication, it was fine. Okay. So, right. um, and then I went to a rehab, and I actually had to go for about a year. Wow. Um, my, yeah, but that actually ended up being my choice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I went firstly for my family because they had enough of me. And mm -hmm. then after I sat for about three months, I decided I needed to do this for myself. Mm -hmm. So along with that, I realized I needed to help people. Mm -hmm. So I then decided to study further and I just specialized in addiction mm -hmm. because this is not an easy road and it's nobody's choice. Uh -huh. So I thought if I can do this, I need to help others learn how to do it as well. So, but so, I really did drink heavily. Okay, so you said that your family had, had enough of you. Could you tell us a bit about that? My sister and my mom, unfortunately, mm. my father's passed away. He was also an alcoholic. Uh -huh. um, said, we won't speak to you again <laughs> unless you go. And I wow. threw a tantrum like a typical addict. I'm a victim, you know. Mm. Um, it's not my fault. You haven't lived my life. And um, eventually I went because I thought I don't want to lose my mom and my sister. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going, but it was the best journey that I needed to go on because I actually found out who Jane was. Mm -hmm. And for 30 years, I actually had no clue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew I, how to make sure everybody else was happy, but not myself. Right. Okay. So, so Jane, tell me a bit more about who you are then. When you discovered who you are, what did you mean by that? So... Dr. Raj, I, funny enough, have suffered from huge anxiety and was then diagnosed with general anxiety disorder at about the age of 28. Um, and obviously, I don't, the drinking did not help at all. I mean, you wake up more anxious. When you're drinking, it's fine, but not afterwards. And um, yeah, I just, I just didn't know how to make, I didn't know who I was. I'd, I've represented um, South Africa for swimming from a very young age with my, my wow. province. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was a swimmer for, from the age of six. Um, mm -hmm. So I knew how to train, I knew discipline, I knew what was expected out of me, but uh, I, I didn't know who Jane was. I didn't know if it, I can't say, Dr. Ross, that swimming was my dream or if it was something I wanted to make my mom happy with. So at 17, I overtrained and I was injured. And I uh, then went to university and I discovered alcohol. <laughs> I love, was love the look you gave when you, you said that. <laughs> it was like, wow, just, just that's an amazing know, thing. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> right. It was just social drinking then. It was <laughs> just, the right. Divorce hit, the right. divorce came along. Right. Um, I was extremely lonely. And obviously what I did realize through my therapy was a rejection and loneliness of my primary triggers. Right. Which okay. I had no idea about. So right. I now know to always be on the lookout for those type of feelings. And I know how right. to handle them when they pop up. Right. Let's go back to the swimming thing. Okay. So you, compet you competed at a, at a very high level. You were like a winner. Is that right? At a national level. Yes, I did. Yes. Tell us a bit more about that. So that was, 
Um, I nearly drowned. I actually did nearly drown at the age of three. Wow. And I was yanked out the swimming pool by my mom just in time mm -hmm. and straight away went to swimming lessons. Mm -hmm. um, we then moved to a city called Port Elizabeth, which is now called, don't laugh, in South Africa, Wilbecha. So I can get the click. And I went straight into swimming. <laughs> and they noticed I had a talent. So from the age of six, I think I represented my province. And from the age of six? From the, from the age, age of six? six I was Butterfly swimmer, yes. Okay. But you nearly yeah, drowned at three. Youngest. So from nearly drowning at three, i.e. not not being very buoyant, <laughs> to say the least, within yes, three yes. years, you are representing your province. That's amazing. And I can remember Dr. Raj drowning. I can remember it. It's my very first memory. Okay. Very peaceful. I wasn't panicking at all. Right. So it's okay. quite strange. If I think back, I can remember just looking around and not panicking at all. Right. So for me, that was strange because everyone said, you know, they think that's one of the worst ways to die. And I would think, I don't mind. What I remember didn't seem so bad. But I mean, I was three. Right. Um, but yeah, then training just started from there. From the age of six, you start training twice a day. Right. Um, I don't know how I got through school, but I got a varsity pass. So I must have somehow did it. Right. And then went to university. So I wasn't actually upset when the injury came along. Right. Um, but back, but back up a second. Time. Sorry, I want to go back to the drowning thing. Sorry, sorry, I want to go back okay. to that. Okay. So, so I find this fascinating. So, what do you remember? It's your very first memory. It's amazing that your very first memory is of drowning at the age of three. What do you remember of that? I remember, don't laugh, my little boyfriend was on the side of the pool and I didn't have my water wings on. And he said, jump in, jump in. And I said, okay. So I jumped in, but I didn't come up again. <laughs> so, Somebody luckily called my mom <laughs> and she right. must have jumped in in a panic and pulled me out. And obviously I was coughing and I swallowed a lot of water. Right. But um, subsequently it became quite a big trademark in my life because I also then went and did life saving afterwards, obviously when I was right. old enough right. and competed in the life saving events as well. So, but yeah. Dr. Raj asked me to swim a length of a swimming pool now. Mm -mm. Uh, that that won't happen. <laughs> Why is that? Think, Why is that? I think I'm too unfit. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, interesting. When I decided so to stop, not, I stopped. <laughs> you haven't swam for how long then? How long have you not swam for? I, I do swim, but I can't compete. My shoulder, the operation wasn't a success. Oh, okay. So okay. yeah, so I, 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 the tendon in my shoulder grew too big. Okay. It was hooking onto the bone, so they oh. changed the bone. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. But um, okay. it's fine. I still now for fun. Okay. But let's back up a second. Let's go back to when you were six and competing, right? The, what about your relationship with water? I would have thought nearly drowning at th three, the classic thinking in psychology would be that you're not comfortable in the water and you're a little bit nervous about drowning. But what was your relationship with being in the water from that point onwards? Because it sounded like you got really comfortable being in water. Well, that's what I was going to say. The funny thing is it wasn't a scary experience for me. Hmm. I can just remember looking around and seeing, obviously, the, the blueness of the pool, but there was no panic. Yeah. So wow. it didn't seem to have affected me. Now, obviously, went to swimming lessons the very next day. Yeah. And, um, yeah, then the swimming obviously continued from there. And, yeah, yeah I'll absolutely, my happy place is water, Dr. Roger. If I'm in a bad mood, yeah, just put me in a swimming pool. I don't need to do anything. I just have to be in the water. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so you, you're a member therapy. Yeah, first memory is of serenity. You were serene. And, yes. and that's kind yeah, of come strange. back ever since. You feel yes. that serenity again. Interesting. Yes. Okay. In anything with water. Yeah. Okay. So your first boyfriend at the age of three told you to jump in and you just did. Because yes. you've got that kind of, you don't realize that men are dangerous. Yeah, yeah, men are dangerous. And <laughs> you're talking to a people pleaser. Well, did, she didn't know she was one. <laughs> If he was happy, I'd jump in. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Right. Interesting. Okay. Anyway, so listen, you obviously had a talent and you competed. What was competing like? Did you enjoy winning? What was, because again, elite athletes like you have an interesting relationship with why are they doing it? What's driving them forward? So what are your thoughts about that? I would go to swimming five in the morning, get back at seven, be at school half past seven. Um, and then I started, tr and then evening training, I think was from half past five to half past seven. And then I would walk from school and go and do the gym in between. So 
so there were some days I loved it. I mean, it's a whole bunch of us that are friends that we got obviously grew very close to. Um, but I did not, I couldn't sleep at a friend's house, you know, like you do when you're younger, because who wants to wake up at five? So I luckily had great support from my parents. <laughs> Mm -hmm. He woke me up every morning. Even if, if I pretended I was sleeping, they would wake me up um, mm -hmm. with a bana half a banana and half a cup of coffee. And mm -hmm. off I went to train. And there, I mean, there were some days I cried. I remember crying when it was really, really tough. Mm -hmm. But you just carry on. It's, there's normally like some stupid song going on in your head that keeps on going around and around. Mm -hmm. And then the galas are obviously, when you try to get to the nationals, you have to have a certain time. Mm -hmm. So we've got a certain time limit to get to the... Mm. top level to come to actually get in so each gala or meet i think you call it overseas is um is quite it's quite nerve-wracking because i was a butterfly swimmer and when i injured my shoulder i had to change to backstroke mm. so mm. i have three months to get the time to qualify mm -hmm. so you know and often it would be like the second last meet that you got the time to get you there mm -hmm. so it was always nerve-wracking and i think I always had a very low belief in myself, which you might think is strange, but you stand on the block and you think, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, or I'm scared, or what if I don't make it? Or, hmm. you know, so I think if I could have been a bit more positive, it might have been a bit easier, but it was just always negative thoughts that what if I'm not good enough? What if I don't hmm. make it? Hmm. And but that's how you, where I think the thoughts began. Yeah, but how come you kept going? I mean, you kept going despite the fact you were being negative. Or was it your parents were driving you? to do this thing or were uh, you my, doing it my, uh, we did it together i think my mom is a great support i mean every day every evening you know last but i do think my poor family's life revolved around me and i do recognize that now so you know no one ate dinner till jane was back from swimming and out of his swimming cozy and you know out of his swimming costume and in her pajamas then we can all eat supper every saturday and sunday basically there was a gala or a meet so my family was constantly at the swimming pool where I was so I kept going I think I think because I just don't give up even if even if I'm scared as hell I just will not give up and maybe Dr. Raj had helped me get over my addiction because it was something that I realized I wanted to live I didn't want to survive anymore and that was something that was so deep in my heart that I'm so tired of being that person and always making sure everyone's happy. You know, it's so, for me, I get angry with schools in a sense. I want to write a curriculum. Why don't they teach us boundaries at school? Or, or you know, you're allowed to say no at school <laughs> instead of making everybody happy. So uh, that's how Jane's been discovered. I, I'm allowed to say no, and it's not the end of the world. Yeah, and back at the age of three when the guy said, jump in the pool without any... Yeah, oh, I did it. Started then. No, but um, I, I want to go back again to the rigid discipline. Um, so, do you think there's any link between that? I mean, some people would say there's a certain obsessionality, a certain rigidity, almost a certain addiction to the routine. Do you think there's any link between that and and later being an addictive personality? If we can say that, what are your thoughts Definitely. about that? Definitely. So, um, my experience, obviously, in this industry, I've been in it now for just over. I think 11 years, um, addicts feel a lot safer, although I don't put us in a box, we're all different, but with a structure and a routine. And when my structure, and routine, I went into the medical field as a medical rep for 12 years, um, instead of using the psychology degree, um, there was no structure and routine. I had to create my own day. I had to go see, I, I specialize in psychiatrists, so I had to go and see them and, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll get to them in a minute. I want to discuss get your to your opinion on psychiatrists. Anyway, go on. Right. And um, for me, there was no. If, I, if the first appointment was at a ten, well, then I just had to make sure I was ready by ten. If if the last appointment was at three, I'd see them at three. You know, so there was. It was very lonely and very. Um, I didn't seem to have a drive. I can't say I really enjoyed it, and I'm not putting the the profession down. Maybe just it's not for me because I'm quite a people's person. And I think when I got back into, when I went to Rio, there was a huge structure and routine. And I suddenly felt very safe again. As if this, I need structure and routine to make sure that I get through a day and I feel I'm not afraid that something strange might happen next. I know what's next. 
um, and I've got a planned day every single day and this is how I'm going to do it. And look, things don't always work out, but I think that's part of living life on life's terms. But but I was wondering if you were going to say, and you know more about this than I do, that there's something about drug ad- addicts. The drug becomes the routine. There's a sense in which they it, the drug provides structure in a kind of weird way and meaning. It becomes our control. Yeah, like uh, it, it's the strangest thing, Dr. Raj, but they say, well, you know, studies, it says, we controlled our addiction. So not that I don't feel we were in control at all, but I controlled when I drank, how much I drank, um, you know, when I was going to go buy the alcohol, uh, where I would buy the alcohol from, because I, <laughs> I didn't want the shop close to you to think I was an alcoholic. So I went to different stores just in case I was judged. Because um, you're a I people pleaser. <laughs> exactly. How dare the man who owns a bottle store think I'm an alcoholic? <laughs> okay right so so, so I, I yeah, controlled that I thought I did yeah. yeah so when you were so how did the drinking begin you slid into it or you, the way you sort of sparked up a little bit then you said, discovered alcohol university what or was it like an immediate love affair with the stuff I think I realized at varsity that I was a lot more confident on it ah. I mean so, yeah my swimming stopped exactly about three weeks before I started university and I stayed at, a, at in the residence. So, because my, my family had moved to another city, so I went to, I stayed in the res and then I had the alcohol, it was lovely. Well, it made me happy. Um, but I wasn't a big drinker then. You know, when you're 20, 21, 22, it is a weekend thing. Um, I also got married at the age of 22 um, to a Springbok cyclist. Um, ah, but okay. yeah, but he unfortunately had a few affairs, uh-huh. quite a few. So by the age of thirty, we were divorced, and that for me was not part of my plan. By the age of so, what? How old were you when you 30. got divorced? Twenty-two, <laughs> married, thirty, divorced. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But if he was a Springbok cyclist, he was an elite athlete, just like you were an elite yes. athlete. Yes. So you, but he you guys was professional, professional, like trained in Germany. Right. Okay. But. But you were kind of approaching that kind of level of athleticism. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I understood it. But I yeah. gave up my life for his. So, yeah. Never, okay. You know, it, but yeah. I want to get to that bit in a second. But, but, yeah. Sorry to be, you know, my style is somewhat blunt. You must always slap me down if I say anything <laughs> inappropriate. But, but basically, you both were incredible. You're young. You're in your 20s. You're elite athletes. You're, you're both really hot, right? I mean, you're like a golden couple. Is that is that not right? Well, I think, I, I don't know, I think we were. I mean, I, don't laugh, Dr. Raj. If we had babies, I'd hope they would have been successful in some Sorry? kind of sport. If we had had children, yeah. I'm hoping they would have been successful in I think one they, of the sports. Yeah, I think they would have been, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, we didn't. but you're not accepting my point. <laughs> Was it that despite the fact you were this amazing swimmer, um, uh, that you were very underconfident about your... Um, attractiveness to men is that right if I can put it as bluntly as I yes oh definitely I didn't have a boyfriend my first um, boyfriend I ever had was second year university right how come is that because yeah, so, of the discipline of swimming men I mean not that you know having a boyfriend is a necessity of life but I would have thought that that you would have attracted quite a lot of male attention for various reasons um, if I did I didn't notice it <laughs> okay and I also think um I just didn't have time. I, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I don't know how I passed school. I know I did have a little bit of schoolwork, right. but it really wasn't a priority for me. Okay. Um, I, you know, there were some nice hot guys that swam with me. Right. Okay, don't well, laugh. In those days, they wore yeah. speedos. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But we were really just good friends. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Not, not, not the full cosy now. They wore, oh, I see. Well, that's, and, that, that's, and that was okay then, not now. Say that again, sorry. It was okay to be a speedo in those days, not now. Yeah. Okay, all right. You're sounding very <laughs> disappointed about the way things have turned out. <laughs> I think I'm quite, it's quite nice if they wear the long suits now. But yeah, oh, we, you prefer that? You prefer that then? Yeah, well, I would want to wear one now. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right so look you were actually maybe for various reasons to do with the rigidity of the discipline of the elite athlete thing a bit um inexperienced in the realm of relationships is that right okay and Definitely. and you're also very socially anxious so the drinking relaxed you when it comes to dealing with people okay. Definitely. It, yeah i just uh, a different jane popped out after a few drinks what kind of jane was that 
just out of interest. So it's almost like the Jamie thing now because yeah. I, I wasn't like that. Pre- I wasn't like this previously. Right. Um, I laugh very loudly, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So um, it's charming. Was, you know, it's, it's fine. It's charming. <laughs> All the clients yesterday, Jamie. You know when you hear, I'm like, I'm sorry, did I wake you? Because <laughs> I've arrived. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, right. Yeah, I, I just think I learned that there's nothing wrong with me. Yes, we have faults. We have defects, if you want to call it that, or vulnerabilities. But we've also got a lot of assets. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, to be honest, and this is not a vain statement, Dr. Raj, but the moment I, re- I learned to accept me, faults and all, or learned to love me, so to speak, was the moment I never wanted to touch another drink. Very interesting. But I was, Very I was interesting. good enough. Yeah, mm. I learned I was good enough, no matter what anyone said. But that's a different solution for different people. That's not one solution that works for everyone. No, right? it, it's not. I think for me, though, it was stop hating yourself. Stop thinking you're not good enough. Hmm. Stop thinking you're this failure, you know, and hmm. start accepting that even if you are just plain Jane, that's good enough, you know? Yeah. So, and I think the rejection of, of my husband leaving me for another woman yeah. was I failed at that. I failed at being a wife was, you know, that for me wasn't. Right. wasn't acceptable because I don't fail. I mean, swimming, now yeah. I fail the marriage, you know, then it all started spiraling out of control. Yeah, but you were drinking before the marriage failed. Isn't that all right? Yeah, we were drinking, but more like socially as couples than you go out to okay. a barbecue or to a function. Um, right. My father had died two years before that and my drinking had increased. Right. Um, because I wasn't sure how to cope. But I, so I do understand why he left me in a sense because I wasn't the same woman he married. He married. I mean, okay. I was drinking. Okay. I was starting to increase my drinking. Yeah. Okay. So was it a slow slide over several years or quite a rapid spiral into excessive drinking? I, I would say two years slow slide and then rapid. Yeah. Okay. To the point, well, Doctor Raj, where you wake up and have to have a drink to stop shaking. Yeah, that's called an eye opener in the in the trade. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so sorry to go over territory. You, you know, it might be very unpleasant to go over, but I think it's very helpful. Um, when when you were at your worst, talk us through a, an average day when you were at your worst in terms of drinking. If you don't, if you don't okay. mind, that is. No, of course not. An average day was waking up and having to drink. I probably have woken up in the night quite a few times as well, mm-hmm. and had a drink or two. What kind of drink? Properly. What would it have been? Uh, dry white wine. Okay, um, right. Very okay, specific. And also, it was called way less wine, which meant I wasn't supposed to get fat if I drank it. Okay. Right. Uh, I don't know. That was just what I thought. Okay. So, yeah. um, drank a hell of a lot of it. Yeah. Um, well, how, many, how much? Well, straight, probably, I would say two bottles a day. Maybe even more a night. Yeah. I would get home from two bottles a night. Drinking. Not, not a day. Yeah. Two bottles a night. And that, oh, well, I get more in a day if I didn't have to go anywhere. So how many in so, the day? Probably a bottle in the day and then another two at night. So three bottles a day? Three bottles, yeah. If I wasn't too busy in the yeah. day and I didn't smell too much like alcohol and I could work, yeah, I then did go to work, yeah. Okay, so if, the reason I keep repeating it, as you know, addicts tend to change the number as you keep repeating the numbers. It was three bottles a day then, right? I've just been... Three bottles a day. And then nothing if else? I, if I wasn't working. Yeah. If I was working, two bottles. Very okay. fast. In the All evening right. till I passed out. Wow. Okay, but let's go back to you. Wake up in the morning and you'd have two glasses of wine. Is that right? Before you got out of yes, bed. Because I, I was shaking. Okay. My, you, I, just to feel normal. Yeah. So you were, you were withdrawing by the time you were waking yes. up. Yes. Tell me a bit more about what that was like. What was the experience? What was going on? Well, you know, you just know you wake up obviously more anxious than before. And because mm-hmm. and, and, obviously you're waking up with the guilt and the shame of doing mm-hmm. it all over again. Mm-hmm. And then I would obviously go to the fridge. You know, I was shaking um, one glass as quick as I could and then slowly sip the other and then my shaking had stopped. But mm-hmm. I mean, I must have, I absolutely reeked of alcohol. You know, mm-hmm. you brush your teeth, you use the mouthwash, you have the chewing gum, but as soon as I could finish work and get to a bottle store, that's what I would do. But you're drinking um, at home, but, in a solitary way? At home, all alone. Yeah, I didn't... Okay. I didn't socialize. I didn't go to nightclubs. And, okay. And I think, not, yeah, but just alone at home because I'd moved from Port Elizabeth to Johannesburg by then. Right. Okay. To be closer so, to my family. 
So were you buying a bottle every day to drink or you'd have a stash of them at home? What was the pattern of the so buying? I tried to have a stash, but I was so scared my mother would come and find it because she knew, right. but I was thought she didn't. Um, so I try and buy, buy as much as I could. And, mm -hmm. But I basically was stopping somewhere every single day because my fear of running out was huge. Okay. I don't right. want to run out at 12 o'clock at night and then not have anything. Right. Okay. So were you still yeah. holding down the job of a, as a medical rep then? You were selling, uh, you were visiting doctors yes. to sell drugs. Is that yes, right? yes. Yeah. <laughs> Even though you were drinking three bottles a day. So you were still turning up and working. Yeah. My, my, I, I wouldn't say my work wasn't affected. I, I can tell you I had a few car accidents. A um, few car accidents? What happened there? Well, when you drink and drive, you must be drunk constantly. Right. Okay. So your job involved but, um, driving from doctor to doctor, didn't it? It was driving yeah. was a big part of it, and yet you were on three yeah. bottles a day. Wow. Okay. Tell me, yeah, tell I us a bit about the I car accident. Uh, the one night I well, twi I hit into the back of a car twice. Right. Um, wow. And that, I think that was definitely just due to my my mind not being where it needed to be, which yeah. was to focus. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And then obviously I had to pay third party insurance and all the rest, but um. It was scary, but what did I do? I went home to drink to numb it. Yeah. So it happened, you, but I never coped with it. I just went home to drink. Did you have any physical injuries as a result of the car accident or falling over or any other aspect of drinking heavily? Because people often you know, develop physical injuries. I haven't got a physical injury. I've had a few stitches. Right. Stitches so for I've what? Got a, same place. Stitch here, stitch here. Okay. Because I must of, have fallen over and I can't remember. Okay, but you were in hospital in casualty, being stitched up. Well, the next day when I woke up and realized something was wrong, then I would go, yeah. yes. I, I oh, wow. Okay, yeah. so you, okay, re you realized the injury the next day, right? Yeah. Well, I, I realized, oh, I must have hurt myself, but I mean, you're so drunk. Okay. Um, and I didn't want, I could never phone anyone to come and fetch me because I didn't want them to know. Yeah. Because it was but, very shameful. But when yeah. you're in the casualty department the next day, surely if they were doing their job, they could have figured out you had a drinking problem. Surely. They probably did, but no one said anything. Really? I this is terrible. I, terrible. I had pancreatitis. Twice. Oh, my God. That's a classic, okay. classic medical thing, side effect of excessive drinking. Yeah. And guess what happened the second time? I said it was my appendix because I didn't want anyone to know. So I don't have an appendix anymore. But the doctor came oh, to me. Oh, they took out, <laughs> wait a minute, they took out your appendix because you yes, said. I think, I think it's my appendix. <laughs> and they took it out without yes. realizing you were making the story up. Because I, they couldn't find what was wrong. They kept on saying it's your gallbladder. It's your gallbladder. I was like, oh no, take it out. <laughs> Whatever, it's really sore. Wow. Then, um, wow. Yeah, but this is, this is a very important story about addicts that people need to realize. You guys are very good at deception. And incredible, we good. It's actually quite sad if I think back, Dr. Ross, to the lies, to the manipulation, mm. to even justifying anything and everything mm. as mm. to why I needed to drink and then believing it too. Mm. I mean, if I look back now, I think, oh my gosh, Jane, I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you did that. Mm. You know, and, and, and it's a huge eye opener, especially when you start being a victim. Hmm. And you start having to take responsibility and say, you did that, own it, grow yeah. up. You but know, I, I and wanna, and that, that was huge. I want to talk a bit about this because I think this is very important. Now, I think that you said your family had had enough of you and they said, we're not going to talk to you again. So they, they pulled up the drawbridge and they kind of said, perhaps rather brutally, we're not going to have anything to do with you. And you may have been quite manipulative and threatened suicide. I don't know. We'll discuss that in a minute. But my think that a lot of people have real trouble with this moment because really the correct thing to do as a family is to say we're going to cease all contact until you get your act together whereas the addict says i need your help and it's a manipulative yes. attempt to bring the family back in but this is a scary mm. moment for families because they're worried you're going to go and kill yourself or something if they don't have nothing but the correct thing to do is for the family to say we're having nothing more to do with you until you sort yourself out is that right what's your thoughts about yeah so my mom actually, the first few we had, obviously, say, I want to say save you, but got me in. My sister said to her, leave Jane alone, enough is enough. And my mom said, you've got a daughter of your own, would you ever leave her? So, but anyway, I had gone to a one-month rehab. This is my third rehab. And unbeknown to me, there were discussions going on with the social worker there and my family to book me straight from that rehab into a long-term rehab. 
and obviously when it was brought up, I mean, I screamed, I threw it through a tantrum, you know, um, but I went and my mom said the whole way she was so scared I was going to say, turn around, take me home. But I, I think there was a little, little voice inside my head saying, you're going to die if you carry on. So what have you got to lose? So I finally went, but I can tell you right now, it, it wasn't an easy journey for my family. And that I do apologize for and I do take full responsibility for. I didn't then. I was cross with them. It was their fault. Um, and, they, and they didn't live my life. So how would they know how hard it is? But how many people get divorced every day? Thousands, millions, and I don't think they're all alcoholics. So I obviously lacked a few coping skills in that area and I needed to go sort my life out. I had to get a life. Um, I think I would be dead by now if I hadn't gone. Do you think that the fact you've been through this journey gives you extra authority as a therapist and a counselor? Because I can't help but notice what's interesting about the whole addictions field. A lot of people who end up working in it did have an addiction problem. You don't really get that in the rest of psychiatry. You don't, you don't get most people saying, I treat depressed people because I was depressed. But you do get a lot okay, of that with addictions. Yeah. So, so yeah. what do you think is going on there? And do you think it, it's actually almost an important part of the um, training or the experience? that you, you're better able to be helpful to addicts? I think it helps. I think it helps to understand more. Um, I wouldn't, look, I'm quite, I wanted to say hard. I'm quite, I'm quite, I can be, I can say what I need to say. Like if I, I don't want to swear, but you can't tell a liar a lie. If you know what I'm trying to say. Um, don't try and lie to me. I've been there, done that myself. So you can justify all you want. You can try and tell me if it's this story or that story, but I'm looking straight through you. So I think sometimes just to to get the truth out of someone, not that I ever speak to them in a rude way, it would just be to say, look, you, you need help and it's time to realize it because being there, done that, worn the T-shirts, wearing the same shoes you're wearing, wearing right now. So hmm. it does help in, in, in definitely recognizing, look, you can't take me for a ride, put it that way. Um, because I'm going to see through it. But uh, but let's discuss this a little bit longer because I think it's a very controversial point. I, I believe, I mean, I've not had addiction problems um, uh, other than to men's fashion. But anyway, we're talking about <laughs> uh, alcohol, <laughs> alcohol or, 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 um, <laughs> or um, substances. And um, I think that when I'm dealing with addicts, I would like to argue, and I'm interested in your opinion, that I'm just as good as you are at spotting the deception I would argue. But I think that your advantage is they can't um, and be, be antagonistic towards you um, and say the thing you don't know what it feels like because you've been there. I think you have added authority in the confrontational point because there's going to be a confrontation um, when you don't accept the lie. I mean, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I believe that my ability to spot deception <laughs> is just as good as yours, I would like to argue. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. No, no, I think... I think... To spot the lies is quite easy, but it's to say, okay, so now you've done this, you've done that, you've stuffed up your family, you've lost your kids, what's the next step? You know, and I think for me, it, uh, Dr. Roger, I, what I, I think for me the most important thing is I went to three rehabs before I got well. There were so many things that nobody at those rehabs told me. And like, Nothing changes. I didn't know. I, you know, I think I've spent 28 days in a rehab. I'm going to walk into my house and I'm better now. You know, and there were a lot of, and I'm not better actually. I walked in as lonely as when I walked out to go to the rehab. So give me an hour. I was back in the car getting some alcohol. And so I, I try to make the reality of what they're going to face. I think I've got that as an advantage because for an addict to do life on life terms, it can, life is boring. Life can be hard. Um, life can be great, um, but you've got to take the good day with the bad day and the in between day. And for an addict, we don't want to, we don't understand that. You know, we, we must control the life, and that means either feel nothing or feel in between, but I'm not going to have a bad day. I'm just not going to feel it. And for me, I understand because I ha did not understand emotional intelligence um, until I was actually taught, and you have none. And then I had to de <laughs> develop it. <laughs> but, okay, but I want to talk about the fact you've been in several rehabs. Now, in my opinion, and you know I'm quite forthright and blunt, you must feel free to disagree, there's a lot of terrible treatment in psychiatry and in the addictions world. I mean, some people might say you just need longer treatment, but I would argue 
a lot of the treatment people get is useless because it doesn't really confront the core issues. And that's because confronting the core issues is quite stressful for the therapist, amongst other things. And most people are just going through the motions. So would you agree with the contention that the people think they're paying a lot of money, let's say privately or on the National Health Service, and they're getting a qualified therapist, therefore they think they're getting good therapy. By far and away, the most usual experience is that you're getting terrible therapy, you just don't realize it. But what do you think? Um, look, for me, the first two years I went to, I got no therapy. I, d I don't know why. I, I actually went, I didn't know I was supposed to get. I never got. Yeah. I kind of just yeah. went there. They used my medical aid. I don't know what it's called, insurance or whatever. Yeah. And, um, they took your money. They took your money and ran. They yes. took your money and ran. And then I spent 28 days smoking a chim like a chimney, because that's what you do, sitting around talking nonsense. I, it was very strange. I still thought, is this what you do? I eat a lot of sweets. I go to the tuck shop. I buy some sweets, and then I just talk and smoke. It was very mm -hmm. strange. And then, and then mm -hmm. the, final, the third rehab actually had a structure in the routine. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started realizing, oh, there's more to this recovery thing. Mm -hmm. But unbeknown to me, I was on my way to a long-term rehab behind my back. Mm -hmm. But that was needed because at the age of 30, 32 then, um, I had to learn. I had, I had to grow up. That was embarrassing to go to a rehab at 32, so around about 25 year old. Mm -hmm. um, but I could just talk me to be more accepting, mm. but I, I needed to go. For, it's not that, and you're right. It's not the amount of time. It's the quality, in a sense. Mm. Mm. You can learn coping skills, expectations. What do you need to look for before you go home? What's mm. important for you, and get it right the first time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, I just think it's the knowledge that you impart on the person that you're looking at. Yeah. So I want to I want to talk a bit more about this. I want to go back and again you must always tell me if there's something that you don't want to talk about. You, we don't have to talk about anything you don't want to talk about. But I I believe that a, a drunk woman is in a more vulnerable situation than a drunk man. I mean, a drunk man can get into trouble, but drunk women, for reasons that are too obvious to state, I think yeah. are in are in real danger. <laughs> so can I can I ask you did, did you ever find yourself in very vulnerable yes, situations I because of your drinking? And do you mind talking a bit about that? Not at all. No. Um. Look, luckily, I was never, um, I'd never been uh, in a very traumatic situation, but I did decide to take myself out to the nightclub one night up the road. Um, I don't know why. By then, I was already gone. I mean, I drank so much. And I sat down at the bar, and I had had, I just sipped my drink, and then some person I didn't know told me to come and dance. And when I woke up again, I was in hospital on a drip. Oh, my so God. So I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> Uh, apparently, I just fell over, but okay. I do believe my drink was drugged because I had drunk a lot more than that before, and suddenly I was in a hospital. Right. Um, uh, and not thinking, not caring, I asked a very strange man to take me home. I begged him so that no one had to know. Um, so, yeah, Dr. Raj, I'm surprised I, I, I didn't get hurt. I'm surprised I didn't get in situations... Uh, and I think maybe that's what I want to kind of give back is because I was really protected mm -hmm. somehow, some way, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I did some really naughty things mm -hmm. um, to try and find love. Mm -hmm. I thought if I do that with a man, then he'll love me. Mm -hmm. And of course it wasn't. The next day the man was gone. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's nothing I'm proud of, but it's my, it's part of my story. So mm -hmm. um, it's something that I think people need to stop being ashamed of and just own it. And yeah. just go back to your morals and values that you were brought up on, and that's not who you are. Yeah. What What about women that you've met also recovering addicts and recovering alcoholics in rehabs? Did they, uh, are there any? I mean, obviously you have to disguise details for confidentiality, but are there any examples there of the kind of vulnerable situation they may have found themselves in? There's plenty, um, uh, and they don't easily admit it at first. But if I sort of open up, because I obviously can't use any other examples except myself, I can't use another client. I can't. I say, look, this is kind of what I got involved in. Then they, then they open up. Um, but most women, when they're drunk, are going to go and try and find some kind of relationship with a man, mainly on just a sexual level, um, to try and find love, if I can put it in that sense. Because most women that are drinking, the primary, I, mean, I don't know what your experience is, but the primary trigger is loneliness and, and wanting to be loved. And, and, and that just seems so important to a woman to have a connection. But sex isn't a, a connection. A one-night stand is not going to get me the man of my dreams. 
so yeah, that you deal with quite a lot with, 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 with a lot of the women that come in. What about the fact that you were socially anxious and then the drink kind of relaxed you? Did it make you socially confident? Did it make you flirty, if I can use that uh, word? I'm sure it did. I, I, can't, I can't say I can remember every time, but um, I definitely, um, I really, I must say, I think I definitely was flirty. I mean, I thought I looked fantastic when you drank. I mean, you look, look in the mirror, you're like, you look at me. <laughs> but you probably look like crap. You know, you probably got mascara spread down your eyes or something i don't know <laughs> but right. um i had a good i had i met some really nice people that i wish i hadn't been drunk when meeting them because uh -huh. they you know i think i scared the living pants out of some of, of some of the guys i met mm -hmm. um but at the end of the day i then chose to rather isolate at home and drink which yeah. my mom yeah. always said a woman never drinks alone but mm. that's okay. all i ever did yeah right. mainly okay. that's that's when it was shaking and drinking and yeah, passing okay. out and the security guard. I mean, you know, South Africa is not the safest country mm. as I was living in Johannesburg, which is not the safest city. Mm. Um, and I would fall asleep with my sliding door wide open, passed out there on the couch. Mm -hmm. So the security guard that luckily of the complex would just come and lock up for me. Yeah. Blimey, you are incredibly <laughs> lucky. I mean, the number of dangerous <laughs> things you've done. The, the car accidents, the sleeping with the house wide open. And, and I'm laughing about it now, but it's been so many years that I've had to come to accept and be like really ashamed and guilty about it. But now it, it's made me Jane. You know, I can't take it back. It's my story. I did really stupid things, really horrendous things. But I suppose I, that's Jane now, that's part of me. And I, and I won't be ashamed of it. I'm going to keep going.
Hello, Jane. Hello. Hello. Well, we seem to have lost Dr. Raj Perso. Um, so I'm going to leap into the to the void, as it were. Fascinating conversation, if I may say so. Absolutely blooming fascinating. What are the main points, do you think, from all of this you'd like to tell everybody? What What, what is the main things that you you feel are the most relevant? I think from my side, the most relevant points would be that you're not worthless, you're not a failure, you've made some mistakes and maybe some absolutely terrible mistakes, but there is a way, you know, there is a way you can recover, you How can find life. I, I've got a big question for you because I think so many, certainly on my own daily show, we talk about this a lot. Jay. We we lie awake at three o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and we review every blooming awful thing that's ever happened to us, don't we? It's like a horrible film that replays, guaranteed <laughs> at three. And then we find it hard to get to to to, to sleep, etc. How do we stop that? I think that's the problem, is that, is that the constant guilt and shame we drank it away or drugged it away. For me now, <laughs> I go home at night and to fill my cup back up so that I can be emotionally ready for the others to, you know, in anyone tomorrow. I want to say that I gym every day, but that's a lie. Um, but I definitely put on a series or something just to switch off completely mm. and not really focus on anything. And m at most days, I'm actually pretty tired and I fall asleep quite easily. The um, thing, the thing is, Jane, Jane, the uh, mindfulness, would, would the help mindfulness, with that yeah, chatter. Mm. I it, the thing is, we haven't all drunk it away or drugged it away. Some of us just made really um, bad business decisions, let's say, and those bad business decisions mm. can badly affect us, or we've made bad personal decisions with with partners or whatever. Very hard to stop rewriting history and do the should have would have line of thought mm. it's difficult think... to know hello you know i can hear you perfectly carry on i can hear you i'm sorry no i always have the saying dr dr roger if you what if me i'll what if you back so but what if i had you know, not broken up with her, or what if I had mm. not driven there? I would say, but what if you had? Or, you know, but what, what if you had and what is, was a better decision? Because I can tell you now, the decisions I made yesterday, I might make differently today because I know more today yep. than I did yesterday. And luckily, living in South Africa, in the beautiful area that we live in, I practice a lot of mindfulness. So when the mind is going, I try and listen to the sounds outside, to the birds in the trees, because otherwise I will have a fight in my head about what I should have said, what I should have done, how I can do it better. And that just puts you down again and doesn't get you a good night's sleep. This is the trouble, isn't it? South Africa mm. is very beautiful. I spent a week there. Unfortunately, I spent the entire week in a garage with Ayrton Senna. That was marvellous, but I never got to see any of the oh, countryside. I was, we were filming him for a week. Uh, it was a fantastic experience. We had one afternoon where we were taken around and we could see a bit of the gorgeous country. Oh, my God. What a fabulous place. Why didn't you come back out? Oh, well, <laughs> you, know, you know, I don't even get down to the seaside here in, in, in uh, the UK, let alone about uh, traveling. The thought of traveling at the moment is uh, I just don't fancy it. I see what's going on at the airports. and I, I You'll can't probably lose your luggage. Yeah. I mean, and I don't think I can come to South Africa with just carry on luggage yeah. anyway that's not that's not why you called <laughs> do you think it's important i know that these are not the questions that raj but then i don't have a practice in harley street i don't have a practice at all do you think it's important for mindfulness which i used to call meditation do you think it's important to have beautiful surroundings or can you just be anywhere i think you've got to make it work wherever you are i mean even if unfortunately the sounds might be traffic Yep. Uh, driving past your house at night, um, at least just taking the focus of the thoughts that you are currently going spinning around in your head. 
It's almost like you've got to try and remove yourself completely from the fight you're having with yourself. Yep. And just try and get away from that. And you're, it's very, very hard in the beginning because I don't think any of us live life in the moment. It takes a lot of practice. So if you can just read a good, a nice book, close it, switch your light off and then just lie there and try and relax and breathe you'll find yourself going to bed a lot easier. And there are also a lot of good apps these days you can use. Like, like do, do you want to suggest any? Because sometimes I put on the There's sound of a train. There's one called Headspace that's very good. What's it called? Headspace? Headspace, yes. Okay, okay. And there's also, um, for anxiety, which I think half the world suffers from, oh. there's a tapping app that you can use that helps with, with anxiety itself. Oh, tapping. Yes, we've, tapping. We've had, we've had guests on who do tapping, and I have to say, I thought, well, this is going to be a load of rubbish. It was fantastic. <laughs> it was absolutely. Our occupational therapist does it. It was it. extraordinary. It's brilliant. If you don't know, by the way, if you're watching this and listening to this all around the world, it literally is tapping. It's it's not a euphemism. It is actual, I don't know how to do it, but it's actual tapping. In fact, one of my colleagues okay. was terrified of wasps, and so the tapping expert said what are you scared of phil and he said well i hate wasps and did the tapping and he's been infinitely better isn't that extraordinary just from tapping because it takes your mind off the current issue right and you focus on the tapping and then luckily instead of focusing completely on your fear which us as humans will make way worse than it actually should be um, it then takes it away. Hmm. So it's it called Tapping Solutions if they want to download that's an app. it. That's, that's an app. It's called Tapping Solutions. That's an app. The other app yes. was called um, Headspace. Was Headspace. Yes. Right. Headspace. And th these are worth, in fact, if, if you're having trouble sleeping, hello, that'll be me. But if you're having trouble sleeping and everything like that, there's a, about a gazillion apps out there. Try to see one which work. Poor old Raj. But the reason Raj has disappeared, Dr. Raj Pasod, is his connection. Is, I told him, I said, Raj, mate, pay the electricity bill. He said, <laughs> it'll be fine. <laughs> told him that. No, if, if it was here, I'd just blame it on ESCOM, our electricity supplier. Oh, well, we hate them all. They're all terrible. They're all... <laughs> Let me ask you something, which is, it's got nothing to do with therapy, but as you're live from South Africa, um, are your utility prices going through the roof at the moment or are they stable? Yes. It, our petrol is horrendous, but guess what? It came, it's coming down one rand, which in dollar terms means nothing. Right, okay. Um, but our, our sunfire oil, oil is hugely expensive. Um, everything's just rising. Um, so it is, it is a bit difficult to, to get through a day. You start eating a lot cheaper. You start oh, yeah. doing a little bit less washing. <laughs> yeah. But we just get through. For me, I just try not to notice and just make do and have the best day, whatever happens. I don't know if you saw in the news. You probably didn't, probably didn't make South African news. But I'll just throw this in. Because this is about anxiety. And everything we yes. do actually comes back to mental health. If you buy a large pack of lure pack, which is a sort of butter type spread, right? Lure yes. pack, it's now security locked in the supermarkets because it costs ten pounds. Ten <gasps> pounds. So that's ten times twenty rand. Well, that's two hundred rand. Then. Yeah, I wouldn't buy it. <laughs> well, and it's not a luxury. But Jane, it's not a luxury item. It's it's a normal bog standard essential item. It's just butter. It's not luxury. It's butter, butter, yes. It's madness. So it's all crazy. It's, I don't know how we're supposed to cope. No idea. I, I, you know what? I'm going to go look in my shops tonight and see how much it costs here. Yeah, probably double. Yeah. And I don't understand why. It's an extraordinary thing. I think where you live, it's a, it, it is an absolutely beautiful country. And seeing beautiful scenery, well, it can't but help. It really can't. It can't but help with your mental state. I think yes. it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. I'm sorry we lost Raj. His internet went absolutely bonkers. And, and that and that is that. He's been sending a million emails. <laughs> in a, he's, in a great old, he's in a great old state. But um, I, I, I hope that I've uh, managed to somewhat fill his immaculate handmade shoes. 
I'm saying I, that. I, I, want thank, I want to thank you for having me. It's been an oh, absolute privilege. Th oh, thank you. Thank you for finding so, the Phil time. So, Dr. Ross, it was my first radio show, and I, I want to thank you very much. Did you, enjoy the, Did you enjoy the experience? It was amazing. I've been oh, so right. nervous. Oh, no. Um, but I loved it. I absolutely right. loved it. So thank right. you so much for letting me share. That's and absolutely And if any given help, just one person, that's great too. You know, I once asked somebody, how do we how do we do this situation? He said, one person at a time. Actually, she said, exactly. one person at a time. And if you can achieve that, that's progress. That's progress. That's true. That's Absolutely. True. Thank you yeah, so, so that. much for joining us. Really appreciate oh, thank it. You. you take care. Thank you. In, enjoy South. I never understand on shows they go, give my love to South Africa. What are you going to do? Shout out the windows? Just stupid exactly. media phrase. Well, stupid give my phrase. love to London and the heat wave you're having there. It's then. just <laughs> even today, it's crazy hot. Crazy hot. No, it's cold here. I don't mind that. You can dress up for oh, the cold. We don't have aircon. Come, come, we'll swap. Oh, okay. Ah, <laughs> aha. Now you're talking my language. Jane, thank you so much. We're going to leave have it Have a lovely there. day. Bye-bye.